And now, without further ado, we begin. Ladies and gentlemen, and the Technicolor rainbow in between. That's what it feels like to have Asperger's. For me. I mean, most of my life, I have kind of felt like a visitor from another planet. White roads to interrupt. It's interrupting. <laughs> Me? My quirks and my uh, challenges as someone who is neuroatypical is for STE a boon, uh, whereas anyone else, there, there would be a burden. I have a picture I'd like to share with you tonight. So we begin is when you begin a certain moment in the piece, and the we end is where you end. Although the end could mean a lot of things, it may be the end of that particular moment, but it keeps building up and up as, as it went along. Spectrum Theater Ensemble evolved from a program developed by a group of students led by Clay Martin at Texas Tech University in 2014. It was founded on the concept of neurodiversity, where adults on the autism spectrum collaborated with neurotypical peers from the School of Theater and Dance as equals. So as a professional artist with learning disabilities, I knew that theater could be empowering and help you find your abilities and strengths in any field. I also knew from my research that people on the spectrum often struggle with social interaction. And what is theater? It's just scripted social interaction that you can rehearse and practice. But what I didn't know though was the thing that I think is the most amazing discovery I've had in my life thus far. Working with men and women on the spectrum, I heard incredible stories and saw unique perspectives on how to view the world and the problems in our society. And I knew that this had to be shared with other people. When I finished my studies at Texas Tech, I knew that this is the work I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I'm looking forward to helping them give that opportunity to more and more people. It's, it sounds kind of corny, but it's like a whole new world has opened up for me. I went by myself, my first time by myself at the theater, and it was amazing. And I couldn't stop smiling. I was just really overcome with joy and excitement and like love for this new group that I met and really excited to be a part of the process of their next performance. I had no idea that, you know, years later I would be serving as the STE president, but I couldn't think of a better place to be. I think theater is successful when there's a learning moment, when something changes, when there's a, a growth that the viewers experience, you know, and for me, I went in that night uh, to go see the play. It had opened my eyes to something that I thought I understood, but I, I didn't really. Everyone is welcome at Spectrum Theater Ensemble. Whether you are on the spectrum or neurotypical, you're all necessary for a neurodiverse environment. When I was diagnosed with autism at three years old, no, two years old, people said I would never learn to write, read, have meaningful relationship, or do things on my own. But with the help of both my family and Spectrum Theater Ensemble, I felt like I was able to accomplish some of these things and still striving for better for myself every day. I think it's important to show other people on the spectrum that they can pursue their artistic career goals and that they don't have to be pigeonholed into stereotypically autistic careers. I think that STE is essential to our community and to the world at large because I believe that people with autism can have a wide range of abilities and talents that are not always represented in society. After our first performance, Clay wrote me a note that said, thanks for taking a chance on me. I'll always take a chance on you. And that meant a lot to me. So, Take a chance on us. I don't think the theater ever changed me. I think it saved my life. And I think Spectrum Theater Ensemble has made it a life worth living. Thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit about Spectrum Theater Ensemble and the amazing work that we've done in just a short time. But we're not done. As I said at the beginning, we started with a mantra that when we did work, we used the words, we begin, and we end. And now, with your support,
we continue. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here to discuss a very, very complex issue. Uh, on the one hand, it might seem to be a simple issue. On the other hand, a complex issue, and that is actually issues. And, and that has to do with the different meanings of neurodiversity and the different meanings of inclusion. Um, and so uh, my name is Barry Prezant, and I'm so pleased to be here with Marenike Giwa and Iwu, and um, also Michael John Carley, uh, who, uh, as you will see, are incredibly knowledgeable with, with a lot of thoughts about our topics for today. So I'm just gonna take one minute and, and talk a little bit about um, the issue of neurodiversity. And when I first heard uh, Judy Singer uh, speak about that, and Michael, if you remember, it was a conference in Australia that we were at. Um, and she just kind of very, very simply stated that it was her master's thesis, I believe in 78. And she said that neurodiversity basically has to do with the fact that everybody has a different brain. And we have to understand that different brains result in in different perceptions, different patterns of strengths and challenges, on the other hand. So why don't we just begin with um, everybody chiming in and, and kind of uh, start briefly with the concept of neurodiversity, uh, and then we'll move on to inclusion afterwards. Uh, and I'll, then I'm gonna toss out some um, hot items for us to discuss, uh, and we'll go from there. So, um, Renike, would you like to start? Whoops, are you muted? Let's try that again. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little too comfortable. I'm against the wall. I'm like the sensory input is just so soothing um, <laughs> right now, but it, um, it just feels good. But yeah, so neurodiversity, um, as you mentioned, um, when I did some research and learned that um, Judy Singer came up with the term, although it was popularized by Hardy Bloom using it in his article, and then um, the, you know, a companion term neurodivergent was um, coined by Cassiana Sasmasu. And so when I think about neurodiversity, I just think about, um, you know, it just makes me think of diversity and then biodiversity, which is, you know, required for human life, a critical element of life. And it just makes me think of the, you know, different brains that we all have. Like, I actually picture, like, brains and they're all different colors, like there's turquoise and there's neon yellow and there's red and, you know, magenta or whatever. And they're all, you know, kind of like swirling around. And so um, just like we have, you know, different socioeconomic groups and different ethnic groups, different racial groups, you know, all of these other aspects of diversity as people, um, you know, we, it's the same with our brains. So even the people that we call neurotypical, their brains are, you know, like two snowflakes, no two snowflakes are alike. Their brains are different from one another. They just happen to um, operate in a way that is, you know, more standard, more common than those of us who have, who are neuro minorities. So um, I think of it as like a neutral term um, you know, in, ter uh, in terms of, okay, so there's dyscalculia, there's ADHD, there's Tourette's, there's autism, there's giftedness, intellectual disability, all that stuff is, are just the different flavors of our brains. Also a great start. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. Hey. So this since you is, jumped in, you got to speak, Damon. What is, yes, what, okay. what, right. <laughs> Go ahead. tell us what neurodiversity means best. to you. Yeah. I will do my best. My name is Damon Neighbors, and I'm just joining everyone. And I agree with uh, the tail end of, uh, of what Marinica said there. Um, every brain has a completely different flavor, too, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I've pointed out in other trainings and things that we're all very individual individuals. Um, but as far as how I classify a neurodivergent person is just a person whose brain is significantly different in some way that contributes to uh, their behavior, presentation, perceptions, sensory experience, and is often uh, sooner or later noticeable by other people. Mm-hmm. Michael. Um, so just to give a little bit of backdrop, um, 
my experience with the word really first came about when I was running GRASP, which at the time was the largest membership organization for adults on the spectrum. And I think it started, even though, you know, all these folks, you know, originated the word many, many years prior, it only started to come into our collective lexicon, I think, when a small group of the autism community was just getting really fed up with a lot of the autism wars that were happening between folks on the spectrum like me, um, you know, and let's say the parents of significantly challenged kids. And, you know, we're just kind of fighting cat like cats and dogs for 10 years. And neurodiversity almost, I think, to a lot of people felt like a, a truce of some kind that, you know, we would allow this sort of separation. It would have some identity um, attached to it. And I don't think, however, that we really had back then a, a, a definition of it whatsoever. I mean, when any, whenever you, you know, release any marginalized community from, you know, the culture that was telling them you can't talk about yourselves in this way, and suddenly they're able to speak, it's not like we all had consent over what the word should mean or what any marginalized group ever needs. The marginalized groups in this world, we all need time to be able to talk this stuff out together and figure it out, you know, in, through a lot of dialogue. And I think that for many of us, it was really all inclusive. And I think that for many of us, it was just the quote unquote brilliant Aspies. And Barry and I, you and, you and I both know that we sort of, uh, you know, had some experience with a school that was sort of walking down that line. And, you know, it kind of, you know, resonated as, you know, somewhat elitist almost, you know, none of those behavioral problems here. Um, and I think now, you know, especially from my experience from, you know, working more in the diversity and inclusion world as well, is just that I've tried to at least intellectually discipline myself by figuring out that for me it's all about behavioral differences and if we're going to make it all about behavioral differences then we also have to make it inclusive and not exclude and that means two things which i think some folks don't really know too much about which is number one the more heavily stigmatized uh psychological diagnoses like your schizophrenia like your bipolar like your border borderline personality disorder and number two um, socioeconomic factors because economic challenges create serious anxieties which cause behavioral differences. So if you're going to tell me that poverty-induced trauma doesn't belong in the world of neurodiversity, I have to disagree. Mm -hmm. I think that any time any of these factors cause us to behave differently and usually from a clinical standpoint will affect the brain, mm -hmm. you're neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. And you, you actually begged the next question that I had. And uh, so I'll toss this out to all of you. Um, and that is um, the boundaries to which the term is applied. I know uh, last year, pre-COVID at a Spectrum Theater Ensemble board meeting, there was quite a debate about boundaries. Um, or is that, is that useless now, uh, given what Michael just described? And what I mean by boundaries are kind of like, is it necessary? And I think I know the answer, but is it necessary to have kind of a named difference or a named condition to go along with the concept of neurodiversity to help define it better? Yes, Marenica. So I wanna go because I, I really wanna hear, uh, like Damon and I have had some conversations about that and Michael, I know you've written about that kind of stuff. So I really wanna hear what you all have to share, but I wanna just touch on one point that, that sure. Michael mentioned that I think that um, is something that a lot of people think about when they, um, you know, who are, you know, outside of the, you know, kind of informed community um, or who Google things. And if I, th I mean, I could put all of my babies through college if I had to have a dollar for every time I say, I'm so tired of neurodiversity. It only doesn't tell the full story. It's only people who are mildly impacted by autism, like we're mild sauce or something, you know, and not <laughs> severe, um, severely impacted. And they have no idea what it's like. And yes, if you're quirky, maybe you have your own little issues, but it's completely different than my child who is doing X, Y, Z, you know, whatever. And that pisses me off because I'm thinking about what Michael said, you know, a brain is a brain. So is anybody going to say, oh, you have TBI, oh, or where's this person was born with this disability? You don't count. That's crap. You know, is a person, you know, is whether it's induced, you know, a disability or what have you, 
Um, I think that if anything, neurodiversity is more necessary and more important for the more stigmatized people in our community than for those who could pass or even though again, it's, it's variable. What, what, you know, I, but I just despise this whole caste system, you know, like, um, you know, I have a, a, you know, a child that's intellectually disabled and he's not the Dalit of the world, you know, of, of the neurodiversity world, in my opinion. I don't believe that it's fair that people, you know, will use these, um, dismissive, you know, terms um, to try to separate out and basically say the only person, you can only have, you know, pride or understanding or awareness of the difference in your neurology if you are at a certain cognitive level or if you're able to speak or whatever, if your behaviors can be masked a particular way. I think that that's ableist and I hate that, you know, and so I agree that it, but it includes, like, I can't say Constance Owens is not in the black community. I wish she wasn't, but she is. I can't remove her. So like, we can't say, pick and choose who we want, what conditions we want to be, what neurodiversity is. It is what it is, but I'm gonna let y'all talk. Amen. Yes, that, that does make me so angry too. Um, I think it's easy to fall into hierarchies and subtypes and subdivisions. And in a way, I'm kind of proud of our community for not doing that too much. <laughs> um, but still there are, uh, I, there's an age old disability, uh, you know, debate, were you born disabled or were, did you have an acquired disability? And mm -hmm. I agree with John Carl, uh, John, John Michael Carley on that. Um, it's, I probably got your name wrong again. Um, don't, but, worry uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He's just seated in the car. Anyway, okay. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, I thought this was a planning meeting. <laughs> We're planning world domination. The neurodivergent takeover. Amen. Amen. But, but yeah, uh, Traumatic brain injury, things like Parkinson's, um, uh, degenerative neurological diseases as well. Um, just anything that affects your brain and is going to affect how you move about the world and how people perceive you. Um, I would also like to throw out that I think being gender diverse is a type of neurodivergency. Uh -huh. And... Um, uh, there's so much overlap in those communities it's very telling and um it it has so many of the same problems we need specialized medical care we need acceptance and um inclusion from society um we need people to stop you know to validate our experiences we need special therapists um so many similarities and of course being trans or, or queer is often disabling by the social model of disability mm -hmm. so i think it's just really instructive to the future um for us to join forces <laughs> in a big way that's really helpful mm -hmm. so so do you think i'll toss this out to everybody i'll begin with michael <laughs> uh, but do you think that uh the value of the concept of neurodiversity being put on the front burner now in our discussions, um, it, it strikes me as a neurotypical person that one of the greatest values is uh, that of depathologizing so much of what has been pathologized, unfortunately, for centuries. Uh, do you think that is a significant contribution or what other contributions do you feel that if we truly can inform and help the public kind of understand what that term is, what benefits does it hold? I think the answer is a moving target because the answer is going to depend on the culture in which you live and how you are sort of presented with. Um, so funny, I was actually on the phone with a university in uh, the Netherlands today and they're so much cooler and more you know, comfortable about a lot of this stuff. And I came across a parent who was like, you know, I don't understand why sometimes people want to pathologize my kid who just rocks in chairs all the time um, and give him a diagnosis. And I sort of said to her, I think maybe in the Netherlands you might have an argument, but I know that still in pockets in the United States, and certainly when I got diagnosed 20 years ago, maybe not now, that if we didn't have the diagnosis, if we didn't have the quote unquote label, 
then we were thought of as second-class citizens because suddenly all our differences were surrounding our character. And that was also embedded in how we thought about ourselves, which was even more problematic. And once we had these words, these labels, then it became about our wiring, not our character. Mm -hmm. And the biblical difference in how you're going to think about yourself is what mandates, based on many cultures in this planet, the fact that most of the time, I still think we need the labels. Someday, we won't. Someday, especially uh, to Damon's point, you know, intersectionality will take over, um, but we still have certain differences which need explanation in the public eye to mm -hmm. the point, and you know, the DSM 85, you know, that is due to come out, you know, in the year 73, 84, <laughs> um, that when this stuff is all talked about in that DSM, that, you know, all this stuff is just gonna be thought of as natural extensions of the human experience. Mm -hmm. Written by psychiatrists, right? Yeah, exactly. But we're not there yet. We're yeah. not there yet. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe we need to have a, a DSM committee that includes everyday citizens, parents, uh, yeah. the full range, uh, so we don't yeah. put into pathologizing categories. Yeah. You know, actually, I want to I hand something off to Damon, because she, she brings up a great point to the conversation that you know, I used to think of intersectionality as acknowledging the different aspects of you. You know, there, you know, there are just too many of us that have more than one marginalized part of ourselves where, you know, whether it's an ethnic, racial, gender, um, sexual orientation, economic background, age, uh, status within a company, difference, you know, that puts you in a minority as opposed to a majority. And, you know, I used to think that you sort of acknowledge the two um separately but didn't necessarily because they were separate subjects you didn't intermingle and damon i i guess you know i would ask you because my you know i'm sort of learning from a lot of colleagues now that no the better way to think of it is to actually you know because again we are moving targets is to blend them now blend them now and just let whoever you are basically exist and go free with that rather than sort of almost setting them aside for examination which i must admit was the the older way in which i thought of intersectionality is that kind of how you see it or well we started out uh in science by separating everything into little categories like carolus linnaeus doing all the different taxonomy of living things now science is moving towards well how do these living things how are they alike mm -hmm. how how does everything blend together um, and I think that's the next step. Uh, once we learn how things are different, we learn how things are alike and mm -hmm. how they work together and how they overlap in the persons of the same people. Um, as <sighs> pretending to be normal, um, was about being neurotypical, but it was also so much about being a cis femme woman for me that those things are not separable. I can't really unwind. Uh, you know, which aspect of my marginalization caused which trauma and which coping mechanism and things like that. It's all kind of a whole to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand for purposes of explanation, you do have to separate things out mm -hmm. and um, do a little comparison. Yeah. So. And, and I think also for purposes um, for how people may react to one part of your identity. So I'm gonna pass this on to Marenike. Shameless plug here. Marenike gave a beautiful talk on intersectionality for a podcast. And I'm a visual thinker, and you gave a beautiful description of the intersection and what happens if you're standing in the intersection. Would you care to kind of take that and go with it? Absolutely, and it's, um, and actually the, um, the, the, the Example comes from Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, so who, the founder of the um, term intersectionality, um, when she was talking about some of the court cases like um, the Graffin Reed versus General Motors and some of the other cases where they were, you know, where people were trying to tease away the race from the gender piece when that doesn't really work. And so the example was um, that Dr. Um, Crenshaw used was imagine that you're in a in an intersection. So you're like positioned in the center. And then there's vehicles coming from every direction. 
you know, so you're in the center. You have no idea if the vehicle on the left is going to hit you first or the right. You don't know if it's the one on the top, the bottom. You don't know who's going to hit you harder. <laughs> you don't know if they're going to hit each other while they're hitting you. All you know is because of where you're located, each one, you are at risk of being, uh, you know, of having all of these vehicles collide and, and, and there's nothing that you can do about it. You're simply positioned right there at that intersection. And so like, you know, and when I, when, when in non-COVID times, when I um, do like intersectionality 101 presentations, I ask for um, five volunteers and I have one in the center and then I have the other four and I just tell them all to close their eyes and walk forward. And, you know, I have, and I'll give like a door prize to whoever like guesses which one will hit the person first. And I ask them to walk slowly and like gently, you know, but, um, but you know, the visualization does help because that's how it works. Kind of like Damon was saying, like thinking about like, you know, the book pretending to be normal. It's not just oh, the neurotypical aspect. It's also like, you know, Leanne Holiday Wiley was, is a cisgender woman having to, there's a particular expectation that's Put upon you when you look at gender and sexuality, um, geographic location, socioeconomic status, religion, all of those things. Like my um, two autistic children, my son and my daughter, very different services that they receive, very different um, expectations of the two of them. Um, and they are very different children, but I, I can't help but see that gender definitely plays a role in that. So, so we're definitely moving into the realm here of intersectionality in terms of your self-identity versus what people choose to focus on when they meet you, as they get to know you. Uh, so so let, me, let me bring up another issue, which has to do with relationships over time as well. Um, I'm a developmentalist. All of my training is in social, emotional, cognitive, and all those other kinds of development in children um, and beyond childhood. Uh, so I want to introduce a term and you might say, oh, come on, Barry, that's ridiculous. But I'm thinking of kind of the notion of, uh, you know, developmental neurodiversity, uh, that we're not just looking at snapshots of people at a particular point in time, but how that evolves over years, over decades. And it, you know, it reminds me of a, a, a pretty terrible article that was published, and I go back this far, so I remember, in the late 60s, um, and the article was, I think, in Archives of General Psychiatry. I'm a speech language pathologist, I'm not a psychiatrist. But the article, the title of the article was, um, Autistic Children Become Schizophrenic When They Grow Up. And it was four, quote unquote, case studies of uh, kids on the spectrum who probably had a fair amount of scripting, but when they scripted when they were older teens or young adults, it looked like they were hallucinating because they were no longer a younger child, okay? So I'm just, any, is there any value, do you think? Because I haven't heard people talking about neurodiversity from a developmental course perspective um, for whatever that might contribute to the conversation. I would jump in with a, a simplistic answer to start us off. Um, and, and the simplistic answer has to do with um, the fact that you know we're not taking into account when we have this discussion, we first need to also ask how much masking is going on. You know, how much is being revealed as opposed to natural development? Um, how much do we feel we are allowed to share and know and therefore be diagnosed, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that like a lot of the time when, you know, like people in the early days of autism have said, you know, you can't be on the autism spectrum because you're able to do X, Y, and Z. And a part of me, you know, of course, wanted to shout out to them, motherfucker, I worked harder at it than you ever have. Thank you for invalidating all the hard work that I did, you know, to, to, to do this. Um, but the real answer, you know, luckily is more like, you know, that when we choose to assimilate, and I stress the word choose, because some of us do not choose to assimilate. I do, um, because I want certain things, and I'm perfectly proud of that. Um, but the answer that I always give is that, you know, just because I learned fluent French doesn't make me French. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling this okay. discussion a lot. That's a really good example because, I, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, as a, an adoptive parent, 
Um, you know, thinking about, you know, one of my children who used to, French was her native language. She said, you know, when she talked in her sleep, it used to be in French. And the last three years, I've noticed that when she talks in her sleep, it's in English. So it's kind of like it's her, her, her mindset has shifted. But it is interesting what you're mentioning, because like I think about, so I've always thought about, um, I never thought about it in terms of like the development of neurodiversity, but I'm thinking about other aspects of development that I've always felt varied. For example, um, it, in, in my family, it's normal to, for your dentition to occur very early. So I remember going to dentists and, you know, they have a, in, you know, my, you know, my family's from West Africa. And so there's certain things that the dentist does, a pediatric dentist at a certain ages, because you're supposed to be still losing teeth. I mean, I had lost all my baby teeth, you know, when I was still in elementary school <laughs> and I had friends in high school who were having to get them pulled so they could get their wisdom teeth, you know, like late, you know, they hadn't erupted yet. And I got my wisdom teeth early also. And I remember people being confused about my age because my dental age was not what they would expect it to be. Um, Similarly, some aspects of puberty, depending upon um, certain, you know, nutrition and what have you, may occur at different stages for people. And I, I've always noticed that in communities of color, and particularly in the Black community, everyone always assumes that you're much older than you are, even if you don't look older. It's just, I think your race just throws three years on, on you to people because the people don't, you're no longer a child, you're an adult. And that's why I kind of, I think about, they even use the, talk, the infantile schizophrenia discussion um, that people used to have with autism. It's the same um, you know, people are doing the same behavior, but they're doing it in the body of an adult and not that of a child. And so I think that developmentally things like, I, I think development, the problem that we have is I think it's, I really wish there were more people who would um, share things about development as a whole, because I think you have such a, a holistic view because in society, I think people think development is linear. You do this at this age, you do this at this age, you do this at this age. So if you're ahead, you're doing great. When you're behind, you're doing horribly. What about, about those of us who are neurodivergent, who are ahead here, but behind here? You can read at a college level, but you can't tie your shoes. You know, and so on, like, you know, so, um, and which skills? It's very, you know, spiky. And so I think it, it, I think because of that, it kind of does kind of force the sense of, like Michael was saying, of choosing to assimilate, um, because sometimes it's assimilate or perish, you know, like, I know that, um, you know, I was in, kin again, I learned how to read at two years old. I'm hyperlexic, like a lot of neurodivergent people, you know, twice exceptional. But I remember that there was um, an assignment when I was in um, one grade, early, early elementary, where you had to memorize your address. And I didn't know my address. And so um, basically, this was like every day you had to come up to the teacher's desk and you had to recite your address. And I couldn't remember mine for the life of me. And despite the fact that I could write, read and write, practically as good as my teacher, I was worried about getting left back to the point where my mother pinned it to the inside of my shirt and said, read it. You know what I mean? Read it right before she asks you and then see it. Um, that's not cheating because you're not reading it while she's cheating. But to me, that seemed like cheating because I didn't remember it in my head. So like that was an aspect of development. I'm thinking, so you're not caring about all the way I'm scoring on all these charts, but I don't cut fast enough. I don't remember this or I didn't get that joke. So I'm wrong. I just think it's really uh, amazing how when I was a child, I was considered vastly more mature than my peers in some ways, um, while not feeling <laughs> mature at all. But now as an adult, I am considered very young seeming. And uh, it's just like I'm never developmentally correct ever in my life. And um it's just very frustrating. Um, I've always had intergenerational friendships. Um, I have certainly um, grown and gotten more and more skills with age, especially when it comes to being able to read people. And a lot of that is just a lot of really horrific trial and error, let me tell you. You know, it's just... Um, but it, that is also something we have to do so, to survive. And, uh, you know, people are always saying, well, you, it's impossible for you to read another person correctly or something. I'm like, no, we learn. <laughs> we, we get better at it over time. And I think a lot of, uh, we're not looking, of course, at, at development over the course of the lifetime. And a big gap there in our knowledge is how autism changes into middle age and old age. And um, I've unfortunately seen some of the bad consequences in my older neurodivergent relatives and how they were not, um, their increasing anxiety with age was not taken into account. 
um, their accompanying uh, physical disabilities that come with age, um, exacerbated a lot of um, things they struggled with autistically. Um, and it just makes me angry that if nobody's willing to do uh, uh, research over on, on the life course, you mm -hmm. know, the course of your life. Um, and that's a big gap we have. Michael. Uh, I don't think I have anything to follow up with that. I mean, I, I your hand up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was I was trying to support Damon and just say that I've made some pretty, pretty silly mistakes myself. No, right. yeah. And that was a solidarity that, hand up. That was a solidarity. Yeah, that was yeah. a pretty you know, yeah. you know, as both an educational uh, consultant and also a friend to so many parents and um, and one of the things I think that's most valuable to say is development is lifespan. So you, you need to get away from the fear mongering professionals who say, if your child doesn't do so much by five, if your child doesn't do so much by eight. Um, and I tell the stories, you know, even though speech is not the promised land, I tell the stories of some people on the spectrum I know who didn't start speaking until well into their teen years and, 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 and so forth. Uh, there, there's another issue related to this, which I think is directly related to neurodiversity. And it's a concept that I learned from um, the late T. Barry Brazelton, uh, the developmental pediatrician. And that's the concept of developmental regression, that it is typical in development to go through periods of dysregulation, what appears to an outside person as regression, but it's kind of a piece of it is kind of reformulating the way you understand the social world the way you understand cognitively your life and events in your life. And it's during these periods of reformulation that a person is more naturally dysregulated. Um, but I, I think that I see that so clearly in people on the spectrum I've known for decades over the years. And again, it could be fear mongering. Oh no, you know, he's regressing. We got to stop these behaviors as opposed to, no, he's expressing more opinions you know, or she has to learn other ways to express her opinions, um, especially for kids with, with much more challenges in, in communication uh, who do not get good augmentative systems. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that uh, from a neurodiversity perspective, how can we help people, especially practitioners, to understand that in this flow of lifespan development, Bumps in the road don't mean ring the alarm bells and you know bring out the behavior plans all the time. <laughs> I got a, a thought. Um, so I think about um, like if you think about you know immunology. So I'm going to give the um, I do a lot of work in HIV advocacy. So I'm going to use a, um, an analogy. So people talk a lot about viral suppression. You know, in the 80s, you know, people thought that HIV, you know, having HIV would progress to AIDS and it was an automatic death sentence and there was a lot of discrimination, stigma, homophobia that isn't completely gone, unfortunately, but, you know, we've had tons of advancements and, you know, many people who are living with HIV are, have a lifespan that is equivalent in some cases longer <laughs> than that of people living without HIV now that we have, you know, you know advances in medication. And um, so they talk about viral suppression, which is basically having the um, HIV virus that's in your blood um, at a constant, at a particular rate that it stays, you know, underneath to where technically when you look for it on, in a lab, it, there's not enough to, to measure like it's even there, even though mm -hmm. it is technically there. Um, and so um, then they talk about blips in the CD4 count. So a person will, um, you know, there's a range of what's normal in terms of how many CD4 cells you, have, you need to kind of survive. And they'll range and you'll have blips. So there'll be labs people will get and they'll see, oh, well, my, you know, wow, my CD4 count was really high. It was 884, it was 1200, but oh, it's 500 because I maybe had a cold last month. As long as it, it's, so it, it, you know, but what they'll tell you is you're still virally suppressed. Okay, so maybe your HIV went from this to this, but you're still under the, the radar. Okay, maybe your CD4 went from this to this, but you're still under the radar. It's seen as normal, like a normal range. And it's not regression. It's not like you need to freak out and change your medication because something changed. Your body changes, your circumstances changes, change, your weight changes and all of those things. And I, I wish that we would kind of take that into account when mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, development and what we see as regression that, you know, there's periods of, of folks' lives 
that, you know, for whatever reason, you know, require more emotional and intellectual energy and where one may appear to progress or regress. Mm -hmm. I have to say personally, I feel like I had a productive regression during this last year of quarantine. Um, I felt like I was mentally ill, um, that I was not handling my emotions in a mature way. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just a process of me working through several things that I needed to work through during obviously a time of high stress. Um, but yeah, it's like a, the butterfly in the cocoon has to basically, uh, the caterpillar has to dissolve itself into a puddle of oh, dysregulation yeah. sometimes to become something, to rearrange all those parts into a, something more beautiful. Mm -hmm. I think one of the best and sim simplest but best sayings to come out of COVID is it's okay not to be okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think so many more people experience that than ever before. So I'm going to, I know Michael needs to uh, depart uh, shortly. So let's shift the conversation. I'll start with you, Michael, to neurodiversity and inclusion and steps that we need to take. I think some of them we're feeling are pretty obvious, but what do we really need to push on? What do we need to prioritize to change the world, as we say, right? Yeah. Um, well, right off the bat, I think the one thing that people need to understand about the word inclusion is that right now it's really being overused. Um, it's, it became the buzzword in education about five or 10 years ago. And you see a whole host of examples where the word is being used and where people are patting themselves on the back for inclusive classrooms or what have you. And it doesn't take a lot of digging to discover that their ideas about what inclusion looks like can be kind of superficial. I, I just even mentioned the inclusion classroom. You want to broadcast that you have an inclusion classroom, but does that mean the rest of your school is exclusive? Because that's not inclusion. And if you invite, you know, all the disabled kids in your neighborhood to the dance, you know, and you say, well, we're including them. And yet when they get to the dance, they're all lined up against the wall and nobody's talking to them. And nobody's asking them to dance. That's not inclusion. It's especially dangerous because those old draconian special ed classrooms um, can be looked upon as actually more developmentally healthy for them because they're at least able to make friendships in those classrooms. Whereas sometimes in these, you know, inclusion situations, people just don't know how to put people together or make inclusion work within, within that room. So I would say the first thing, you know, that we have to look at, unfortunately, is how badly we've been implementing our ideas of inclusion. But the good news at the end of that rainbow, though, is that you will never, I don't think, come across, you know, a teacher that doesn't want to make their, their, their environments inclusive. You might come across principals that don't care about making their schools inclusive, but you know, teachers are different. And you know, if you will show the teacher how to make that classroom inclusive, they will thank you for it. There's not gonna be any resentment for progress in a classroom like that. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as what we, we need to be working on, um, as far as inclusion is, we still haven't gotten far enough as, as far as uh, reframing who is at fault in uh, communication and social problems. Uh, I just still see uh, adults who have uh, caseworkers being told, uh, given worksheets about, uh, well, what error did you make in this social thing that went wrong? How can you fix your error? And it could just be they encountered discrimination in the workplace and it's not their fault at all. You mm -hmm. know, um, we have to understand communication is a two way street and uh, the most important kind of co inclusion in workplaces and schools is teaching uh, neurotypical people um, how to think about us, how to approach us, how to make sure we're not left on the side of the wall and bring us in. Um, they need to be more proactive and we have to train them to understand how to include us. And we shouldn't have to do that, but we know that's not how the world works. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, yeah, it's it's about improving neurotypicals as well. <laughs> so, as a neurotypical, I say, absolutely. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Marenike? I don't really have a whole lot to add other than the, um, I just wanted to highlight the thing that Michael said. I was like, wow, this is so real. Like about how people will say, well, we've got this really, really inclusive classroom. But then you look at the rest of the school and I think about like, so being that my younger children were diagnosed as autistic before I was, I came in first with a parent hat before my self advocate hat. And I remember talking to parents and they'd say, oh, such and such school. It's like a terrible school, but their autism program is like really good. I mean, don't send your neurotypical kids there because they might get jumped. But, you know, send your autistic there. So it's like basically, oh, this school, you know, like when I'm wearing my, you know, middle class or my cla my classist or whatever, my racist or whatever hat, this school is totally inappropriate. But they're really doing great with this thing. So it's kind of like, you know, what we were talking about earlier about all of these different aspects of, of you know, understanding people and respecting people and neurodiversity being a part of a larger part of disability justice as a larger part of human rights and you know um and not always assuming that it's the person to blame is the one who is you know is is the one that's the neural minority it the you know communication is reciprocal and, and you know we learn to navigate others world doesn't it's not you know unreasonable to expect people to under, to try to navigate how we communicate and think and be inclusive of us. It's you not know, always our fault. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what I'm hearing underlying, you know, what everybody said is, is the whole notion of meaningful relationship. Because we get beyond stereotypes when we connect with a person on a deeply personal level. We appreciate them for everything from their differences to the common interests we may have with them, what we could learn from them, um, just the way they react to us, even as a neurotypical, you know, when we're upset, when we're stressed out, when we're dysregulated. Um, and, you know, what I've seen over so many years is when the relationship piece happens, sometimes more so organically than planned, but especially in the school years, when that happens so much, goes away in terms of the bullying, um, where you actually have neurotypical kids who are defenders, <laughs> if you will, or at least they try to let people know this is not acceptable in our culture here at all. Um, and, and, and it's so much about the relationships. And I, um, you know, some of you don't know this, Michael knows this, but I, I thank, you know, goodness for me that I started out working for years in summer camps with children and adults before I kind of took an academic path because it was all about just sharing months, year, summer after summer, um, which it has to be about relationship. <laughs> uh, so it, it's just, just so important. Uh, any other concluding thoughts? I think, um, you know, you guys have been just tremendous and I, I think we really went beyond just the surface here. We really dug in on some issues. So uh, I, I would love to throw a concluding thought, actually, and it's based on a lot of what Marenica and Damon have been saying, which have made me think about how so much of our conversation is really about relativism. And, you know, again, you know, whatever we're doing in response to the culture in which we find ourselves. And I know that one of the things that really saved my hide was travel, because travel told me there was more than one way of doing something. And so if I wasn't doing things, quote unquote, the right way back home, I didn't need to feel as bad as I did prior when I was traveling. And as, as Barry and Teddy know this, I don't know if you guys know, but I was this like minor, minor league diplomat at the UN. And that was my career before moving over into this particular field. And it was right around the time when I was getting my diagnosis and I was doing a water treatment repair project in Iraq before we invaded, like Saddam Hussein's Iraq back then. And at the time, the, the economic sanctions that uh, the United States especially had perpetuated were causing literally 5,000 uh, children under the age of five to die every month as a result of things like waterborne illnesses that, you know, just the importing the, the chemicals and the coagulants to repair those facilities would have saved them. But, you know, we were calling them weapons only stuff at the time. So it's horrible, horrible stuff. And 
I, a couple of times I, you know, went over there and you go inside these hospitals and there's always a room full of the small kids. They're emaciated. It's not pretty. And it's kind of a heavy story. So I apologize for that. I don't mean to trigger anything either, but um, there was one time when I took a delegation of vets over and um, there was actually, no, this is a separate one. Anyway, one of the members of my organization asked one of the, the doctors overseeing these wards, doctor, how many of these children will live? And he laughed and he said, none of them. And right around this time, I was considering this career switch because my son and I had been diagnosed. And Marenica, you and I have that in common as well. I got my diagnosis through my son. Literally, we were diagnosed a week apart. And when I came back to the States, one of the things that made me sort of think to myself, yeah, okay, I, maybe I can handle a career in this, was listening to a father whose significantly challenged son um, had been making noises and flapping his arms in a supermarket. And this father was sobbing over how unfair life had been to him. And I'm listening to him and just fresh off one of those trips to Iraq. And, you know, you're just thinking, your child is alive. Shut up and love it. Mm -hmm. total mic drop right there because that, that's how i feel too i'm like autism does not kill your child your child's still right there you know as a, a parent of children you know ha having you know my I have a child with pediatric heart disease and other diagnoses when you when your child is nearly and actually almost nearly dies then the last thing you care about is if they're flapping in the grocery store or making noise spinning around because they're alive to do that <laughs> you know i so i think it's people you know it relativity is very important i think people need to um, think more broadly and um, be grateful. And th that's why, even though I know it's old, I still love that Jim Sinclair's don't mourn for us. We're not, we're here. We're here. There's nothing to mourn about. Adjust yourself, adjust your expectations, do whatever you got to do, you know, but we're here. Mm -hmm. Thank and you for I, that example. I applaud you, Marina Kay, for the word grateful. Because that's the thing. I, I have written about how much I hate the holiday of Thanksgiving because I think it encourages us to, just, to be ungrateful the other 364 days of the year. <laughs> so I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Damon, any thoughts, concluding thoughts? Uh, not really. That Very well put, but I, I'd just like to thank you all for having me on. <laughs> oh, sure. Great. You know, one thing I feel I need to kind of chime in, something that I've learned from our parent retreat weekends that we've been doing. A lot of parents want permission to be okay with their kids. Um, it's this constant pressure from the outside about how you should not be okay with your child flapping with your child, bolting down a supermarket aisle but not hurting anything, or you know, or your child echoing speech or whatever. Um, and and I, the more I hang around, the more I believe if we can really help parents at the earliest ages for the kids who are diagnosed at an early age to totally change their lens, then so right. it's gonna cut into, the, then those parents will be the one to depathologize. Yes, and I know you need to go, Michael, but you can't go yet. Let me just say this really quickly. Because <laughs> what Barry made me, mentioned made me think of something. Do you all remember that old movie, Parenthood? Not the show one, but the old school one. You could like find it online or whatever. I'm gonna, so there's this scene at the end where one of the characters is worried because his youngest child, he's got three kids, one of them is in a play. And so in the, you know, in the play, she's be, the sister is being attacked because she's like a bear or a tree on or whatever she's being attacked but it's just all part of the, sh the show the you know acting but the little toddler brother all he sees is somebody's beating up on his sister he's like oh no you don't not my sister he gets out of the the seats and he goes on the stage and he starts fighting the kid and people are like no stop and the teachers try to stop and he's running and his sister's trying to say no it's okay and nobody understands what's going on and so there's people there's like one of the teachers is looking to the side and, and glaring at the parents talking about he's writing the play he's writing the whole play and then the father is like freaking out and then he there was an analogy his grandmother had given about a roller coaster and about how it's so much better than just the merry-go-round that just goes the same way should that it, that things have to have twists and turns and so he starts imagining the sound of a roller coaster and he's out of control and scared but then he looks over at his wife who should be mortified and she's like bursting into laughter thinking this is <laughs> 
And then he looks around and some people are horrified and a lot of people in my audience are laughing and he realizes again, the relativity piece. Yeah. Is this the biggest problem of life that my two-year-old loves his sister enough to go ruin this play? I mean, like <laughs> from his perspective, he's protecting her. So he, you see him kind of calm down. He'd been very anxious and stressed out about his children's um, not meeting the status quo and being different, you know, and one needing therapy and so on. And eventually it's like, you see like a shift in his mentality. And I think society and professionals gaslight these parents. It's not just us autistic people and neurodivergent people, they gaslight. They gaslight parents into saying, you're a crappy parent if you let your child do that. You're a crappy parent if you don't implement this, if you don't do this, if you don't um, hit hard, hit early. And they, you know, are scared and they don't know what to do. And they entrust in this advice that only causes a rift between them and their child. Yes. Fabulous, Monica. Fabulous. Thank you.